context. Sometimes when you're reading and you come across a word that you don't know, you can use context clues to make an educated guess as to what the word means. Now when you're looking at the word you don't know, you don't want to just look right before and after the word. You usually want to look at the sentence before and the sentence after. And sometimes you even have to look at the whole paragraph to get an idea of what that unfamiliar word means. Now, there are some clues that we can look at to help determine what the word means. One thing you can look at is a description. Sometimes a sentence or a sentence following or before the unfamiliar word will give you a description. For instance, the green feathered macaw. Well, you may not know the word macaw, but by seeing green feathered, you can infer that it is some kind of a bird with green feathers. Another clue you can look at are synonyms. If you hear the soft and supple leather, well, since you have soft here and then supple, both describing leather, you can figure out that supple probably has something to do with being soft. And in reality, it means moldable. It's easily moldable. And it is somewhat soft to be able to do that. We'll go ahead and note that this one was our bird. Now another clue you can look for are antonyms. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have a malevolent bone in her body. Well, you may not know what malevolent means, but you probably know what sweet means. And if she isn't malevolent and she is sweet, then you can figure out malevolent is something bad, something negative, the opposite of sweet. And in reality, malevolent means evil. Another clue you can look for are definitions. Sometimes the sentence before, after, or part of the same sentence your word is in will just give you the definition of the word. For instance, the echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia, and then they might tell you some interesting fact about the echidna. Well, in commas, right after echidna is the definition of an echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia. So you know what it is right there. The last clue you can look for is tone. Is the rest of this paragraph positive, negative, happy, scared? If you have a paragraph that's all one tone, then the word probably has something to do with that. If it's a scary tone, then this may be a word that it has to do with something scary. If it's positive, it may be a happy kind of word. So you can always take that into consideration whenever you are taking your educated guess. So once you've looked at clues and you've tried to figure out looking before and after the sentence your word is in, looking at the whole paragraph, seeing if you can find a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or figure out the tone surrounding that unfamiliar word, you want to take a guess as to what the word means. And then you want to reread the sentence to see if it makes sense to you and ask yourself, does it make sense? So if we were to insert bird here, the green feathered bird. Well, if it's something that has feathers and we have bird after it, that makes sense. So that one would work. The soft and supple leather. So if we know it means something else soft, maybe moldable, we could say the soft and moldable leather, the soft and flexible leather. Any kind of word like that that you put in that was similar to soft would work. It would make sense in your sentence. Okay. We were thinking evil here, something the opposite of sweet. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone in her body. That makes sense. She is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone. Now, the echidna sentence is a little different. If they plug in a definition for you, then it's a little harder to check. You would just say an egg-laying mammal native to Australia and then maybe tell the sentence after that point because the definition's already there for you. There's not really a synonym for echidna or anything else you could have come up with for what that one meant. And once you've checked to make sure they all make sense, then you have a pretty good idea of what that word means. And you can see how using these context clues of looking for a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or the tone of a paragraph can help you figure out that pesky, unfamiliar word.
Many times readers come across words that they are unfamiliar with. So it's important that readers understand how to determine the definition of a word based on its context. This means looking at the words around it and how the word is used in the sentence. Let's look at a couple of examples. This first example says the elderly scholar spent his evenings hunched over arcane text that few other people even knew existed. So the unfamiliar word here is arcane, but you will see that you can pretty much determine the definition of that word based on the words around it. Here we see the word elderly coming before scholar. So if only an elderly scholar would be studying these texts, then it means that it must be some kind of complex subject that only someone who has acquired much knowledge and wisdom would understand. And then we also see that it says that few other people even knew existed. So that means it's something rare or something that only a few people would know about. So here we have easily and quickly determined the definition of, our, of arcane. This next sentence says, Ron's fealty to his parents was not shared by Karen, who disobeyed, disobeyed their every command. Now you'll notice here that there's not very many words that tell us the definition of fealty. Instead, we see words that tell us what fealty is not. Because here it says, Karen, who disobeyed their every command. Here, Ron is being contrasted with Karen. So if fealty is not disobeying their every command, then fealty must mean obeying or being faithful to. Because notice here we're seeing that Karen disobeys their every command, but Ron does not. So Ron must mean not disobeying. In other words, it means obeying. So you see here how by looking at context clues, a reader can quickly determine the definition of a word. And although it may not be the exact definition, it generally, generally will be the definition for that word in that particular sentence. And so this can be very helpful because it helps a reader be more efficient because determining the definition of a word based on context is much quicker than consulting a dictionary or a thesaurus. Denotation and Connotation Denotation is the literal meaning of a word, the dictionary definition, what you would find if you pulled out Webster's Dictionary and looked this word up. The connotation of a word is the whole literal meaning plus all the emotions that word might evoke. Now, connotation is more subjective. If someone has had certain experiences or feels a certain way about a word or has memories associated with the word, they may feel a different way when they see a word than someone who hasn't had those same experiences. So connotation can be different for each reader. Let's look at, at some examples. Cheap versus inexpensive. Now both cheap and inexpensive mean not costing a lot of money. Dictionary definition, they both mean not costing a lot of money. Now, when you hear the word cheap, you sometimes think low quality. You think if it's cheap, it doesn't cost a lot of money because it's got low quality. Where with inexpensive, it's more of a neutral word. You just think not costing a lot. This one doesn't have the same connotation. Inexpensive doesn't make you think that you're getting a lower quality item, where something cheap might make you think that. Let's look at another example. Rat. A rat is actually a long-tailed rodent. But sometimes people are going to use rat in a sentence that doesn't quite mean a long-tailed rodent. They're using it expecting you to get a certain connotation of someone being dirty or sleazy and so someone may say, he is such a rat, and it means that it's a sleazy person. He is a sleazy person. Now this one is a little bit special. It's one of those that you can think about the connotation and think about who the reader is. If the reader is someone that likes rats, it's an animal lover, or that's even had a rat for a pet, then they may not think, oh, rats are dirty, rats are sleazy. They may think, oh, they're such cuddly creatures. And they may just think of them more in the long-tailed rodent situation. But that's where connotation is more subjective. And most people will still understand that in certain sentences, rat is being used to mean something negative. 
Now let's look at some examples with the word snake and figure out which one is showing denotation and which one is showing connotation. If he weren't such a snake, we could rely on him to tell the truth. So really, a snake is a reptile that slithers along the ground. But certain connotations come with a snake. People may think of someone dishonest or someone unreliable. And so we have to look and see if in this sentence they're talking about an actual reptile or if they're talking about a person that maybe isn't honest or reliable. And in this sentence you see the word rely and truth, which kind of tell you you're maybe looking at the meaning that isn't so literal. If he weren't such a reptile slithering along the ground, we could rely on him to tell the truth. Well, that doesn't make much sense. If he weren't such a liar or a distrustful person or an unreliable person, we could rely on him to tell the truth. Since this one has more to do with what you might think a snake means than what the literal meaning of a snake is, this one is showing the connotation of the word. You're thinking more of a liar or a distrustful person. Now let's look at the next sentence. One of the largest types of snakes is the boa constrictor. And this one, are we talking about reptiles? One of the largest types of reptiles that slither along the ground is the boa constrictor? Or is it a person that doesn't tell the truth? One of the largest types of people that don't tell the truth is the boa constrictor. That one doesn't make much sense. This one, they give you an example of an actual snake, so you can tell this is the literal meaning, which is going to be the denotation. So, you can see that understanding if a word is using a connotation or denotation is going to help you understand what the sentence is about. When you are reading, understanding if you're looking at the denotation or connotation of words can make a world of dis difference to that sentence meaning. Multiple meaning words. Some words are spelled exactly the same but they have different meanings in different contexts. So you have to look at context clues to figure out which version of the word you have in your sentence. One way you can do that is by looking to see if the word is a noun or a verb. The grammatical category that the word is can determine what the word means. And vice versa, if you aren't sure of the pronunciation but you know which version of the word is being used, you can figure out what the part of speech is. So let's look at our first example. Trip. Trip can be a vacation, which is a noun, or it can mean to fall over something, which is a verb. So when we look at our sentences, she took a trip to Colorado. If you aren't careful, you might trip over that step. In this sentence, she took a trip to Colorado She's taking a vacation, so you know this is a noun. Alternately, you could say, oh, a trip is a thing you might take, so it's a noun, so it has to mean vacation. If you aren't careful, you might trip over that step. This one is being used as a verb, so you know it means you might fall over that step. Alternately, you could say, you might trip over that step. Oh, in this sentence, trip is something you're doing, so it has to be a verb in this sentence. So either way, finding out if it's a noun or a verb can help you figure out which version of the word you're using in that sentence. Let's look at another example. Degree. Degree has at least three different meanings, and this one's a little trickier because they are all nouns. Unit of temperature is a noun. A title earned at graduation, if you earn a degree in astrophysics, that is a noun. Or the amount or extent of something is a noun. So finding the part of speech won't help you determine meaning with this particular example, but reading the sentence and using context clues can help you figure out which one we're talking about. He didn't notice when the temperature rose one degree. Okay, and this one, 
He didn't notice when the temperature rose one degree. You can look at temperature to know that this one is talking about a unit of temperature. So you're using your context clues to figure out the meaning of this word. Our next one, the business is only hiring someone with a degree. So are they hiring someone with a unit of temperature? Everyone has a temperature of something. Are they hiring only people that have earned a title through graduating? Or are they only hiring people with an amount or extent? And that one didn't really go any further, so it wouldn't be the amount or extent of something. So this one, if you sub in their title earned at graduation, this business is only hiring someone who is graduated. This one is going to have to do more with title at graduation. And then our last example, it was hard to tell the degree to which he really cared about the outcome. And this one, did he, was it hard to tell the temperature to which he cared about the outcome, the title earned at graduation, or the amount or extent to which he really cared? And in this one, it's the amount or extent to which he cared. Maybe he didn't care that much about this, and so it was hard to tell, or maybe he was keeping his emotions inside, and so it was still hard to tell the degree to which he cared. So whenever you're finding words that could mean more than one thing, our special multiple meaning words, you want to look and see the context around the word. Look at the whole sentence to see what would make sense. And if you know multiple meanings of a word, try each definition that you know to see which one makes sense so you're understanding the sentence correctly. Those multiple meaning words can be tricky. Prefixes, suffixes, and root words. Have you ever been reading a book and come across a word that you've never seen before? Well, if you can break that word down into prefixes, suffixes, and root words, then you can probably figure out what the word means. For instance, orthography may be a word you've never seen before. But if we break it down into its prefix, ortho, its root word, graph, and its suffix, y, then we might be able to figure out what the word means. Ortho means correct or straight. Graph means right or draw. And Y means the state or condition of. So if we put all those together, we can get the state of being written correctly. And when we compare the definition we came up with with our actual definition, you can see they're pretty close. The state of being written correctly, writing words using the proper letters. So you got a pretty good idea just by breaking the words down into a prefix, a root word, and a suffix and figuring out what those meant. And even if you only knew graph had something to do with writing, you would have an idea that orthography had to do something with writing. Let's look at another example. Geometric. We'll break down into our prefix, geo, our root word, metra, and our suffix, ik. Geo means earth, and we put that with metra, which means measure, and ik means having to do with. So, if we put all of those together, we can come up with having to, to do with measuring the earth. Now, this one isn't quite as close to the actual definition relating to the branch of mathematics that has to do with measuring points, lines, and angles, but it does have measuring in there you would be able to tell from the root word measure that geometric is going to have something to do with measuring. So if you ever come across a word that you don't know, first try to figure out what the prefix is, the root word is, and the suffix is so that you can maybe get an idea of what the word means. 
you can see how important prefixes, suffixes, and root words are to understanding what a word means. Many times it is important to be able to identify two words that are synonyms. Now, some words are perfect synonyms and other words are nearly synonyms. Rarely are you going to find perfect synonyms because you're not going to be able to generally find two words that have the same definition. So generally what you're looking for are two words that are nearly synonyms, meaning they have almost the same definition. So we have the word superfluous up here on the board, which means more than needed. So if I ask you how your day was going, and you said my day has been wonderful, extraordinary, out of this world, unbelievable, I could say that you were being superfluous in your description of your day because you were using more words than needed. So we need to find a synonym that goes along with this word. So we have A, which says senseless. So it is senseless to use more words than needed. So we'll put a star next to A because that could be it. B says unique. Unique and superfluous definitely are not synonyms. We come to C, which says excessive. That's a pretty good synonym for superfluous. D is unwanted. We could say that superfluous means unwanted because if you use more words than necessary, then you could say some of those words are unwanted. But I would say that excessive is a closer synonym than unwanted. So we'll X that out as well. Then we come to E, which means obstinate. That obviously is not a synonym for superfluous. So we come down to senseless and excessive. And so we're not going to find a word that means exactly the same thing as superfluous, but we can find a word that is very close. So we're looking for the closest synonym. And so some people might disagree with me here, but I'm going to say that C is the closest synonym to superfluous. So we're going to go with C, which is the word excessive. So remember, you're not finding two words that have exactly the same definition but instead you want to go through the words you're provided with and mark off the ones you know are wrong and then narrow it down a little bit and then from there decide which word you think is a synonym of the word you're looking at. Prefixes, suffixes, and root words. Have you ever been reading a book and come across a word that you've never seen before? Well, if you can break that word down into prefixes, suffixes, and root words, then you can probably figure out what the word means. For instance, orthography may be a word you've never seen before, but if we break it down into its prefix, ortho, its root word, graph, and its suffix, y, then we might be able to figure out what the word means. Ortho means correct or straight. Graph means write or draw. And Y means the state or condition of. So if we put all those together, we can get the state of being written correctly. And when we compare the definition we came up with with our actual definition, you can see they're pretty close. The state of being written correctly, writing words using the proper letters. So you got a pretty good idea just by breaking the words down into a prefix, a root word, and a suffix and figuring out what those meant. And even if you only knew graph had something to do with writing, you would have an idea that orthography had to do something with writing. Let's look at another example. Geometric. We'll break down into our prefix, geo, our root word, metra, and our suffix, ik. Geo means earth, and we put that with metra, which means measure, and ik means having to do with. So, if we put all of those together, we can come up with having to, to do with measuring the earth. Now, this one isn't quite as close to the actual definition, 
relating to the branch of mathematics that has to do with measuring points, lines, and angles, but it does have measuring in there. You would be able to tell from the root word measure that geometric is going to have something to do with measuring. So if you ever come across a word that you don't know, first try to figure out what the prefix is, the root word is, and the suffix is so that you can maybe get an idea of what the word means. You can see how important prefixes, suffixes, and root words are to understanding what a word means. When a reader comes across an unfamiliar word, it's important that they know techniques to understanding the word's definition. One way to determine a word's definition is by looking at the prefix and suffix of the word. Although there are many words in the English language, many of those words share a common prefix or suffix. So by understanding the meaning of that prefix or suffix, the reader can then determine the likely meaning of the word. So, one way to determine word meaning is structural analysis, and that's by looking at the prefix, the root, and the suffix, all of a word. So, take the word unacceptable, for example. Here you have the root word, except, that's, that, because that can be a word in itself. And then here you have the prefix, un, and the suffix, able. The prefix is always going to come before the root word, and the suffix is always going to come after the root word. Now, notice I said the root word is the word that can stand alone. I understand that able can also stand alone and is a word, but in this case, it's a suffix. So if you saw un or able written by themselves, you would see it written like this. That's because the dash represents the word. So here, since un is a prefix, the word comes after the prefix. And here with able, the word becomes, comes before able because able is the suffix. So say you didn't understand what unacceptable meant. Well, you could look at able and you know that means able pretty much and so you know acceptable must mean able to accept. Well un you know means not so from words like unprofessional because unprofessional means not professional. It means the opposite of. So you know that un means not acceptable. It's something that's not able to be accepted. So thereby using the prefix and the suffix of the word and knowing the meanings of those, the reader can determine the meaning of the word unacceptable. Now some words like backward don't have both a prefix and a suffix. They just have a suffix. So back is the, um, the root word, and word is the suffix. So say you didn't know what, what backward meant, but you knew what the root word meant. You knew what back meant. But you remember the word toward, which also has the same suffix. And you know that means going somewhere. So you could um, get an idea that this suffix has something to do with direction. So since you see the root word back, you mean it goes, you know it means going back to. And so that's another example of how to use the prefix or the suffix to determine the meaning of the word. And some words just have a prefix. Uh, this word, for example, has a prefix and a suffix, but no root word. Here, bio is a prefix, and ology is also a suffix. And um, they share that O. And so you could look at this and think, okay, I don't know what this means, but I know I've seen the word bio before and the word biography. Well, that's a book about someone's life. So bio must mean life. And then what does ology mean? Well, I've heard of archaeology, and so that must mean um, the study of something because you're studying something. So ology means the study of. So by knowing the prefix and the suffix and what they mean of this word, you can uh, conclude that this word most likely means the study of life. So it's important to understand common prefixes and suffixes so that you can um, determine the meaning of an unfamiliar word. Understanding how words relate to each other can often add meaning to a passage. 
So it's important to understand synonyms and antonyms. Synonyms are words that mean the same thing, and antonyms are words that mean opposite things. So take, for example, the words dry and arid. Those words are synonyms because they pretty much mean the same thing. They have similar definitions. Now the words dry and wet are antonyms because they have opposite definitions. They mean the opposite thing. Now consider these words, friendly and collegial. We would consider these words synonyms. However, they do have slightly different meanings. Friendly means more on an intimate setting, just a friendship, whereas collegial means something more of like an, an academic or business relationship. However, we still say these are synonyms even though they have slightly different definitions. Because if two words had exactly the same definition, then we wouldn't need two different words. So it stands to reason that synonyms are still going to have slightly different meanings. Now sometimes words are so different that they cannot be synonyms, even though they are somewhat alike. Like, consider the words hot and warm. We would say, yes, these words are alike, but the definitions are different enough, we wouldn't call, the, call them synonyms. So, like, take this sentence, for example. He burned his hand on the hot stove. Now, if we said that hot and warm were synonyms, then we could relate, replace hot with warm. And the sentence would say, he burned his hand on the warm stove. But that doesn't really make sense because you don't think of someone burning their hand on something that's warm. So, as you can see, hot and warm mean similar things, but they are not synonyms because they are too different in meaning. So, the important thing to take from this is that synonyms are words that have exact or similar meanings, and dry and wet are words that have opposite meanings. Understanding how words relate to one another can be important to understanding a text. So it's important to understand synonyms and antonyms. Synonyms are words that have similar meanings, and antonyms are words that have opposite meanings. So let's look at some examples. Dry and arid are synonyms because dry and arid have similar definitions. Dry and wet are antonyms, though, because they have opposite definitions. Now some words like hot and warm have similar definitions, but they're not synonyms. See, hot and warm aren't synonyms or antonyms because they're definitely not opposites, but they're not similar enough to be considered synonyms. Although you may think of them as the same thing. Look at this sentence, he burned his hand on the hot stove. If you were to replace hot with warm, the sentence would no longer make sense because it would say he burned his hand on the warm stove. Well, people don't burn their hand on something that's warm. They burn their hand on something that's hot. So it's important to realize that hot and warm are not synonyms or antonyms. Now, down here I have listed some pairs of antonyms. Light and dark, good and bad, right and left. Notice these are total opposites. So things like black and gray are not, is, that's not a pair of antonyms because black and gray are not opposites and they're not similar enough to be synonyms. So they're not synonyms or antonyms. And some words just don't have an antonym. Like what, what would be the antonym of chair? It doesn't have one. So look at this list right here, red, fast, skinny, and sweet. Every word in this series has a clear antonym except for red. There's no clear antonym of red, but obviously the antonym of fast would be slow, uh, skinny would be fat, and sweet would be bitter. So it's important to understand that synonyms are words that have similar meanings, and antonyms are words that have opposite meanings. But in order for words to be synonyms, the meanings have to be very close. And for the words to be antonyms, the definitions have to have opposite definitions.